from the 1980s to the 1990s, the drug epidemic cost millions of lives and billions of dollars. The use of crack cocaine exploded on the streets of South Central Los Angeles, increasing violence and crime all over the city. The incarceration rate increased as the homicide rate grew exponentially. The decade of dreams actually began over 40 years ago with Pastor Tommy Barnett to reach the lost and broken of Los Angeles. This dream flowed over into a young man named Matthew Barnett. It's not about us, it's about helping others while you're hurt. Who wanted to love and serve people who were hurting. Jesus was the example of this. Whenever the pain was strongest in Jesus' life, he served the most. Matthew noticed the old, vacant Queen of Angels Hospital in Echo Park, and he saw his father's dream could become a reality. This was only the beginning. Welcome to the Dream Center. Hello, I'm Pastor Matthew Barnett of the Los Angeles Dream Center, and I'm so excited to have my wife Caroline with us on the show today. Thank you for joining us. Here at the Dream Center, we see a lot of hurting and broken people. Since 1994, when Pastor Tommy and Pastor Matthew Barnett launched the Dream Center, our mission has always been to reconnect isolated people to God and a community of support by providing basic services that address immediate and long-term needs in areas of homelessness, poverty, addiction, and abuse. When I walk through the Dream Center campus and I see all the people that God has brought here to go through the recovery programs, and then stay to serve in ministries and give back. It's truly incredible to see what a person goes through and how the program helps them move forward. At any given time, we have over 700 residents from all walks of life living at the Dream Center. It doesn't matter where we've come from, how much money we've made, or even how successful we've been. When life's toughest challenges come our way, we can easily find ourselves in hopeless situations. The Dream Center offers free programs and resources for men, women, and children who are in need of a second chance. And parents receive training and services aimed at helping them gain the skill and the tools necessary to transition to independent living. And since the program began in 2008, the Dream Center Transitional Family Floor Program has served 131 families, 400 individuals. Today we believe that the story you're about to watch will inspire you to make an impact in someone else's life. The stories of redemption and restoration that we encounter daily here at the Dream Center reveal the power and love of Jesus Christ. Because of people like you, we're able to share these transforming, inspirational stories of hope. Please consider partnering with the Dream Center so we can continue to make a difference. Right now, you're about to hear the story of one of the men in our discipleship program. His name is Martin. Martin currently is in his second year of discipleship, growing up in an inconsistent family and environment, lacking parental guidance and bouncing from foster care system to abusive homes. Martin spent most of his life angry, bitter, and resentful. Seeking identity and fulfillment, Martin lost himself in a lifestyle of gangs and drugs, which led him into a continuous cycle of going in and out of prison. Take a look at Martin's story. Growing up as a kid, I was a fifth or sixth voice. I used to watch my mom get beat up by my dad a lot. He was always short-tempered. I remember being, being afraid to even ask him things sometimes, you know, not knowing what kind of mood he was going to be in. I remember him um, whipping us with the belt, slapping us. I just always remember being scared of my dad. My mom put up with the, the abuse herself and watching her kids get abused by my dad. I was about eight years old at the time. She left my dad. I know my dad was into boxing. He used to have us um, put on gloves with, with my cousins and, and box. And that always brought joy to my dad. I think that's what I figured I would do to bond with my dad, you know? But that didn't happen because my mom ended up leaving him after, after the abuse and all that. I remember going through the court hearings and all that when, when my mom was going to, through the divorce and, and um, the judge have, asking us um, who we wanted to, who did we want to stay with. It hurt to, to have to um, look at my dad and say, I want to stay with my mom. I love my dad, but I could see the, the hurt on his face to see all his kids say, we want to be with my mom. 
that was kind of like dramatic for me. Because although he did abuse us and everything, still there was still love. Yeah. Um, My mom, being a single mother at that time, then um, didn't have a home or a, or a job to, to support us, so we all ended up in foster care. The foster home it was all right at first, but it started started suffering um, sexual abuse from my foster sister. Me being eight years old it was my first encounter with any kind of like anything that had to do with sex. Didn't really say nothing because I'm a boy, you know. I didn't really. I didn't really know who to say anything to. Probably about 11 years old when I went back home with my mom. My mom got married. My stepdad ended up being an alcoholic after a while and started to, to beat my mom too. Kind of took me right back to where I started. I remember my stepdad grabbing a machete and my brothers grabbing a bat because the altercation I got so bad. My older brothers were like, Bully. We all ended up going to my dad's house. We left my stepdad. He welcomed us back home. All the stuff he had went through with the courts, he had stopped drinking. He had stopped using physical force to try to correct us. Just kind of provided shelter and food for us. And that was it. We were raising ourselves. My older brothers became gang members. And then drugs came into our family. I was still in elementary school. I was already smoking weed. Wanted to be like my older brothers. I remember his friends used to think it was funny to see me high on PCP. I didn't see anything wrong with that. I just wanted to be part of something. I quit going to school, started stealing, doing drugs. I remember them arresting me for stealing a fishing pole at a Kmart. They ended up taking custody. They made me a ward of the court at 12 years old again. Kept me in juvenile hall for a little while, and then they, they sent me to a boys uh, placement. It was like a bunch of group therapy, trying to get me on the right track. I remember going home on the weekends and learning to smoke crack with my brothers. Shortly before I went to, to placement, the oldest brother had passed away from drunk driving. And social worker had told me I hadn't dealt with those emotions or the, the, the trauma that of losing my oldest brother. How it felt seeing him get buried. And they would ask me questions like that. and. Naturally, I would cry, ask anybody about. <sighs> ask, ask anybody about their brother. Ask anybody about somebody losing somebody close to them. Naturally, they're gonna cry. So when they would see tears, they were like, oh, you haven't dealt with the emotions. Um, so you're not ready to go home. Um, it got me, got me angry, so ended up leaving. I left on my own. I started staying with friends, my my, my homies in the, in the hood or whatever, and just started selling drugs. I was already addicted to crack, so that's what I did. My identity, like I said, was to the people that were showing me love, and that was my gang. They had accepted me. At 14 years old, I um, ended up getting an older woman pregnant. She was 20 years old. And I lied to her about my age. I remember her coming and telling me. And I wasn't too happy about it, but she wasn't going to have an abortion. She met my mom and my sister, and she was like, well, he could get a job, and I'll get a job. My mom was like, what are you talking about? He's only 14, you know? Not even 15 years old. Went ahead and had the kid anyways. I tried to be a dad, but I was too young. I was still a kid myself. I was AWOL from the placement. They would raid my mom's house looking for me, and cops would come in through the back, through the front doors, and they'd stop my brothers on the street, asking them, you know, where, where I'm at. They had raided my mom's house for about four or five times looking for me. I found it exciting, but little did I know I was hurting my mom. When they did catch up to me, the judge was like, you're going to be a father. Um, give you the opportunity to straighten your life out. He hoped the best for me. So he sent me to, to away for, for a year at a juvenile camp. Got out and 45 days later, I was arrested for the same thing, selling drugs again. I remember the courts telling me that, that that's it. There's nothing more that they could do for me. Sent me away to the California Youth Authority for four years. I went there and 
It was a bunch of juveniles that were there for murder, robberies on robberies and stuff like that. And went there and it was just, it was gladiator school. I remember my little friends were idolizing me because I was already in, in California Youth Authority. I found a respect in that. My son's mom, she tried to hang around. She stayed, she started living with my mom for a little while. She tried to hang in there. She, she, she hung in there for probably about a year, but um, that kind of fell apart. Um, my sisters, my friends, they, I would call home and they'd start telling me that she was with um, somebody else. And I kind of figured it because the letters stopped and everything. So I kind of really didn't, um, didn't have any hope being with her no more because she'd moved out and um, pretty much um, started living her own life. My boy, he, he um, she kept him away from my family. Even after I, I got released, she'd bring him around, but she, she really didn't really want me to have a relationship because um, she seen I was still doing the same thing. Continued to use drugs while I was in there and couldn't wait to get back out to get high. I came out at 21. I started selling drugs, but in, in a larger quantity. Started manipulating people. I always found myself wanting to catch up to guys that were my age that had cars or whatever. Like, man, I want that, you know? But literally, I know these guys were working all these years that I was away. I um, always wanted uh, fast gratification. I always wanted it fast. And um, it always ended up getting me caught up. I never had a job, didn't need a job. I started making enough money to support myself, live in my own apartment, have my own car. Never even thought I'd be sober because I had accepted that drugs was part of my life. If you didn't do drugs, it was, I, w I thought you were, there was something wrong with you, you know? I was like, I didn't trust you. Been back to prison four times. Done 23 years of my life in prison already. Cause I keep going back and back. I just became a uh, revolving door. Always searched for the, the best deal the courts would give me. I started making enough money to where I could have a, a paid lawyer. I didn't have to worry about having a, a public attorney. I always knew the end outcome was gonna be prison. And I accepted that. The first woman I ever married. You know, I've known her for 12 years. Finally married her and um, but seven years ago, but six of those years I've been, I've been in prison. I ended up getting arrested again for selling drugs and left her alone pregnant. She did everything she could throughout those years to, to take my son to go see me and everything. She was always there trying to help me, trying to save me. Last year, I got out. She begged me, please just stay home. Don't, don't get in trouble, you're on parole. But I did, I was in Orange County selling drugs again. Has there been a time when you've hurt others and even yourself by placing blame on anyone or anything due to unfair circumstances? Do you shift blame in an attempt to avoid the weight of your consequences? Or do you take responsibility for your actions and choose to live right by the word of God? Often, the key to our success is owning our issues and choosing to renew our minds with the promises of God. That's right. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. In Romans 12.2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Humbling ourselves and acknowledging God as the Lord of our lives allows us to cast our cares on Him and to live in freedom as new creations in Christ. We're getting ready to see the faithfulness of our God play out in Martin's life. The transformation that occurred after adapting his thinking to align with the Word of God is incredible. Will you join us today to help men like Martin who have experienced adversity in their lives and many who have turned to drugs or alcohol in the process to have a fresh start? We need people just like you to make an impact in another life. By supporting the Dream Center, you are providing shelter, counseling, mentoring, education, and a foundation in biblical teachings to so many in need. Please call in and support a man just like Martin. Now let's hear the life-changing conclusion of Martin's story. I started praying at nighttime in the county jail, praying to God and making excuses for the things, I, how the way I was raised, the way I grew up. 
And that's why I do these things, but to please help me. They came at me with a 10 year deal. I said, take the 10 year deal. If we don't gotta go to trial with you, we'll give you a 10 year deal. I was like, there has to be something else, right? I was thinking about my son. I was thinking about my wife. And here I was, um, 45 years old. I was gonna get out at 50 at the earliest. I remember telling my attorney, Tom, I need drug counseling. I need help, because I had already picked up my heroin addiction while I was in prison. I remember writing to Delancey and them telling me no, they weren't gonna accept me. Um, Salvation Army, you know, the judge was like, you're not going to a drug program, you're going back to state prison. And it lasted for eight months until um, somebody gave me a pamphlet. I gave it to my attorney, and I told my attorney, and I begged them, you know, explain to the judge where, where, I came, where I came from, why I sell drugs. Don't let them read me off, of, uh, off a piece of paper. Explain to them where I've been and why I'm like this. Tell them that I want to change. Here's a program. See if he'll, he'll allow me to go here. And it was a pamphlet to the Dream Center. Him and the attorney barred back and forth. He told me, come back after lunch. He goes, let me, let's do some research on this, this place. When I came back, he said um, if the Dream Center would, would accept me, that um, he would give me two year sentence here. It's supposed to be the 10, the other eight years I'm on doing on probation. I remember um, praying that they would accept me. And my wife got on board. She started helping me, um, got online, filled out the application, and they accepted me. The judge was like, he doesn't know why he's doing it, but he's gonna give me that opportunity to prove myself. He gave me six more months in the county jail. He said, after these six months are done, we'll release you to the Dream Center. My screwed up way of thinking was, cool, you know, I'm gonna get out of jail faster. We're looking at getting high again. That's, that's where, I, where my mind was. Honestly, I was getting high in the county jail while I was waiting to do those six months. I remember hiding track marks from my wife when she would come to visit. Trying to act like I wasn't getting high. Came to the Dream Center and my whole mentality was I'm gonna manipulate this program and just do what I got to, to get back out. Went through the first year discipleship program. The first 30 days was a blackout period. And uh, I was like, wow, it's gonna be harder than I thought. The uh, reading the Bible and starting to um, have people pray over me, people over other races, and everybody telling me that they cared about me, that they loved me. It was just all new to me. In my mind, I was like, they don't even know me. People started believing in me. Um, that was the hard part for me. The program itself was like uh, being institutionalized. I know how to do these, pro I'll do a program, do what I'm told. But, but it was just all these other things that I had never encountered before. I still battled with it for like two months. It was about the third month, starting starting to cry at, at worship. Certain songs started softening my heart. Stopped being embarrassed to go up to the altar. And all along, every time that altar called, God was always calling me. All this time, my wife was coming to church every Sunday, bringing my son. I remember her always crying and crying. I remember asking her, what are you always crying for? She was like, um, whatever's happening to you, I need you to share it with her son. That's, that's when, that was a defining moment for me to say, I'm doing the right thing right here. I surrendered my life completely then. Started praying for humbleness, for vulnerability. I asked God to take away all the outer shell that I had and to work in my life. That's when things started changing my outlook at and started getting rid of all the bitterness and, and the blaming people and everything else and, and understanding who I am now. I remember my sister coming, showing up, and uh, it was about the third or fourth month of my program. She came to support me in what I was doing here, but she fell in love with God. She fell in love with the church. So she brought my other sister, and she brought my little sister and my nephews, and you know, they brought my two brothers and my mom. I 
um, it was, it was, um, it was like, uh, I would be clear, be clear. I'd be coming a beacon of life, huh? We got 15 people that are uh, my family members that are uh, members of the church now. Come every Sunday to be able to worship with everybody. It's, um, with my family, it's like, it's God answering my prayers of restoration. Ask them to make me a humble man, to teach me to be a, be a father. I got broken relationships that need mending, but I know that'll be in his time. There's still a lot of work that he's gonna do in my life. What he's done so far is, is a miracle in itself. My oldest son, um, he's about 30 years old, little Marty. Um, he hasn't spoken to me in six years. He got tired of the, the manipulation and the lies that I continue to, to do, to say. Tell him, he would always tell me, man, stop doing that, man. Why don't you kick it with us? Stay out here with me. I would, I would be all right for a little while, but I was always back into a mess, selling drugs and doing the same thing. And he got tired of it. Uh, he talks to my family and he tells them, I don't need a dad. That was like the hardest thing for my brother to tell me. Yeah, I talked to him. And I said, what did he say? He said, he said, he don't need a dad. He's grown. He don't need you no more. And that was like one of the hardest things at the end of my program, I prayed that he would be there at graduation, but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't show up. And it crushed me, you know. Still hasn't spoken to me. It's been six years. Um, I would text him and he would talk. He would ask like, who is this? And I'd tell him your dad and that was it. He wouldn't even respond back. It was always hard, you know. It was always, I was always embarrassed to tell my brothers or my mom. Yeah, I'd text him and he didn't want to talk to me. Text me back. But um, last week, um, last Sunday actually, I text him and he texts me back and he asked me, who's this? And like always, and I said, it's your dad. And he said, oh, call me. So last Sunday was the first time I was able to talk to him, apologize to him for, for um, you know, just always leaving him, doing the things I did. He's still kind of standoffish. He's like, yeah, let's take it slow, you know? I think what he wants to see is some consistency. I told him what I'm doing, and he's, 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 he's proud of me for that. Getting over the hump of, of, of loving, loving God before my family, that was, that was a struggle for me at first. When I really got it and understood that after I was able to love God first, He's the one that showed me how to love everybody else in my family. He showed me to love myself. He, loved, he showed me to love, love and forgive everybody. You know, graduating discipleship. First thing I ever completed. It changed my life completely. And it changed everybody else's life around me. My wife, six months ago, she, me and my son, we all got baptized together. A public declaration to the world that we're believers in Christ and we're walking with Christ. And it's not easy. And we're adjusting. It's a new life because we don't live on the outside no more. We're living for Christ now. And change is hard. But to see my son um, pray to Jesus at five years old, that alone is worth it for me, you know, for any sacrifice. I gotta dedicate my time to serving because I work for foster care intervention now. Here we go and, and help people that, that we don't even know. And I remember that feeling when people in discipleship were praying over me, telling me I'm worth something, I'm a child of Christ. That's what started my, my process, my changing, my renewing of my mind. Being in prison, it was no, never any Jesus factor. There was never any kind of love. Being here at the Dream Center, they show you value, showing you who you are, what you're capable of. By the end of these in Christ now, people just look at me and think about me as a gang member still. I disarm them by telling them, hey, my name's Martin, a believer in Christ. James 1 and verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, lacking nothing. Martin spent years of his life lost and bitter, looking to fill a void that only God can fill. But how beautiful is it to see that God used all those broken years for his glory. When we let patience have its perfect work in our lives and we choose to let go and let God, we get caught in the overflow. Today, Martin is not only restored, but God is redeeming him and his family. And I have seen him bring 15 members to church every Sunday, all because of Martin's decision to surrender. Isn't that such a beautiful story? I love seeing Martin and his family on campus. It's a gentle reminder of our Savior and all that he continues to do for us. There are so many more families like Martin's who need the doors of the Dream Center to remain open. All of our programs at the Dream Center are completely free, but it takes generous support of donors like you to keep our programs running. Why don't you be a blessing in someone else's life? In the life of Martin, there are people that are coming out of prison. There are people that are coming out of cardboard boxes. There are people that are living on the street. They had nowhere to go, but they show up to the Dream Center. Why? Because of people like you, people that have gathered around the fire of your living rooms for years and have said, we believe that something good should come out of Los Angeles, California. It's incredible that people like yourself get behind the vision. It's people like you who are sitting in that living room watching the show and you are championing the cause of the Dream Center. And you're championing the cause by getting behind us and supporting us. Will you join us today to help a family like Martin's who has experienced brokenness and addiction to have a fresh new beginning? We can't do this without you. This is the way that we will help others overcome adversity and find love. Please join us by supporting and calling in and helping families just like Martin's. You help us make it possible to serve people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Please consider partnering with the Dream Center, becoming a dedicated supporter of our organization, changing lives and restoring the broken. In fact, we'd love to invite you to come to our campus and see what we're all about. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for watching. Please join us next week for a powerful story full of hope and transformation. You will continue to see how your support impacts the lives of so many people. Come and see what God is doing right here at the Dream Center.